Hello, everyone. I'm Jared Daniels. I'm a curator at the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville, Florida. And my lab deals primarily with insect conservation. And specifically, we work on the recovery planning and implementation for a number of rare, declining, and listed butterfly species across North America. And today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the ongoing cooperative conservation efforts focused on one of our more charismatic butterflies, Shausa swallowtail, which is an endemic subspecies found only in Southeast Florida. Shausa swallowtail was originally described in 1911 from mainland South Florida around the Miami-Dade area. It is endemic to Florida for additional subspecies occur in the Bahamas, Cuba, and Hispaniola. It was originally listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act as threatened on April 28, 1976, and then soon after reclassified on August 31st, 1984 to endangered. And today it remains the only federally listed swallowtail butterfly within the U.S. Shasta swallowtail is exclusively restricted to tropical hardwood hammocks. These uh, within the U.S. are found only in South Florida and the Florida Keys and are among the rarest plant communities within the state. They are diverse upland forest communities characterized by a closed canopy of low growing evergreen to semi-deciduous trees and shrubs, mostly of West Indian origin. These dense, heavily shaded canopies uh, limit the growth of understory plants. So it has a very sparse herb layer. Tropical hardwood hammocks support many rare endemic plant and animal species, including many that are listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. The geographic extent of these forests have been severely reduced by anthropogenic drivers, including development pressure associated with the growth of the South Florida human population that resulted in the conversion of this habitat to urban and agricultural uses. In addition, invasive species and historic fire have limited these habitats. And moving forward into the future, obviously threats related to climate change, particularly sea level rise, and the increase in tropical cyclone intensity and frequency dominate that future landscape. Today, tropical hardwood hammocks occur primarily as remnant pockets within extreme Southeast Florida. Within these systems, the larvae of Shalsa swallowtail utilize two native tree species in the plant family Rutaceae, namely sea torchwood, Amyris and mellifera, and wild limes, Anthoxylum fagra, as hosts. There is a large spring flight beginning at the onset of the rainy season from late April to late June, which coincides with the optimal host resources. As an example, the new growth of torchwood, which you see on the lower left-hand portion of this slide, is preferred by young developing larvae. They have a harder time uh, maturing on older, kind of thicker plant material. There is also evidence of a late summer flight that occurs in August and September and that pupal diapause may be opportunistic and can extend for up to or more than three years. So in many ways, this butterfly is an opportunistic taxon that takes advantage of good years and can ultimately survive bad years. Currently within Southeast Florida, the butterfly is limited primarily to four areas under conservation, Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge, Dagny Johnson Key Largo Hammock Botanical State Park, John Pennycamp Coral Reef State Park, and the heart of the population within Biscayne National Park. And uh, it co-incurs with two other swallowtail species, the giant swallowtail Heraclides crespantes and the Bahamian swallowtail Heraclides and Draymond, both of which occur in much less abundance than Shousa swallowtail. And much of my lab's work over the past several years has been focused on the long-term monitoring of this butterfly within um, Elliott Key, which is the heart of the population within Biscayne National Park. And it's a lovely area to work. Uh, it does require boat transportation to get out to these islands. And it's a fairly long linear island that's dominated by tropical hardwood hammock habitat. And within this landscape, of course, these are areas not sprayed for uh, using adulticides for mosquitoes. So mosquito intensity is pretty high. 
These are very dense, uh, dark forests, as mentioned earlier. The butterfly is very adept at maneuvering within this dense canopy, flying much more like a heliconius than a true swallowtail. Uh, within the island, we uh, primarily use visual surveys and mark recapture to get an assessment annually of how the population trend is going. Uh, and it also gives us additional information, including capture of genetic material, and also some better indication of how far individual adult butterflies actually fly or disperse within the habitat. Uh, and as you can see in this slide, it is uh, a pretty challenging environment in which to work because of uh, the heavy infestation of mosquitoes. Uh, within Northern Key Largo, the other kind of uh, secondary heart of the population, we work with partners, particularly the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and numerous community scientists that go out annually to survey for Shousa Swallowtail. And the pictures on this slide show some of those community scientists at work. And this has been a really wonderful partnership, uh, allowing the public to go out, help us collect uh, a rich data set, but also really uh, become intimate with the environment and understand from year to year how the butterfly populations are doing. And this was a model for a paper that we published several years ago in the Journal of Insect Conservation to uh, develop uh, the use of citizen science efforts to create at-risk databases for Shousa swallowtail and several other species across uh, the state of Florida. And historically, Shousa has been always a fairly um, a rare butterfly, although it has a fairly volatile history of population upswings and downturns much like many other uh, subtropical and tropical taxa. If you go back in time on this graph to the late 1980s, you'll see in 1988, there were fairly decent numbers of adults recorded. But then in 1992, uh, the category five uh, hurricane Andrew made a direct impact on Elliott Key and the islands of Biscayne National Park. And that really reduced the population levels down for some time. Fortuitously in 1992, Prior to Hurricane Andrew, we were able to um, collect a, a hundred eggs that acted as a nucleus for a captive breeding population. And in the years following in 1994 through 1997, we conducted numerous wild reintroductions of adults and larvae to rebuild the population, which, which worked quite well. But then you see after 1998, the population kind of declined. This was a period of prolonged drought. And then from 2004 to 2011, there was very limited monitoring due to primarily the fact that um, much of our uh, support from the federal government as way of grant funding dried up. So in 2011, the Imperial Butterflies of Florida Working Group, which really encompasses all state agencies and federal agencies, came together and realized that we need, needed to do a more detailed assessment of how this butterfly was doing. So we undertook the first full range-wide population survey ever conducted involving more than 100 individuals, uh, over a dozen agencies uh, on the ground. And in 2012, we realized that as a result of that effort, there were only four individuals remaining in the wild that were recorded in that low year. So th at that point, it triggered uh, the alarm bells going off and an emergency rule by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service in order to bring the butterfly into captivity to start an assurance population and also a head starting and captive breeding population. So in 2013, we brought individuals into captivity um, and I just wanted to show you a little bit of video of the, the the population here in captivity at the University of Florida. Uh, it's a butterfly that adapts really well to uh, confined conditions because it's used to flying within the dense understory vegetation. Uh, they will uh, react quite well to smaller confined areas, lay eggs, uh, allow us to really uh, do well at starting a captive breeding population. And from that point, uh, we uh, amassed a fairly sizable uh, captive breeding program that continues to this day. We use those uh, outdoor enclosures that you saw in the previous video, primarily for uh, copulation and for oviposition. And individual females can easily produce over 300 eggs with the maximum of about 550 eggs produced in captivity. 
So they can be quite productive um, within a fairly short period of time. From that point of view, we bring all the individuals into captivity, rear the individuals within laboratory, controlled laboratory conditions, uh, and then as they grow, they're eventually transferred, late iron star larvae are transferred into uh, larger eight ounce cups, individual larvae, one individual larva per cup, with a tongue depressor added, and, and about 99% of the larvae will pupate on the tongue depressor, which allows us to easily move the pupae, record um, information about the origin or the genetic lines of those pupae on the individual uh, wood tongue depressor, and allow a stable platform for adult butterflies to eventually close um, the following year. And under laboratory conditions, we can, we can uh, simulate the spring rains by essentially spraying down pupae, uh, and this will allow us to be able to get at least one more or possibly two more adult generations in a given year compared to one or two in the wild. And a good portion of our work in my lab deals with conservation planning and best practices. So for all the taxa that we work on, we develop detailed recovery uh, planning architecture uh, using the open standards for conservation practice and the software Marathi and work with stakeholders to ensure that we've captured all the relevant information. So we have strategic guidelines going forward. We have kind of uh, uh, basic milestones and uh, recovery actions that can be well evaluated and vetted. And where possible, we try to publish on this information as much as possible, kind of adding to the best practice literature for both captive breeding and organism translocations and reintroductions. And a good portion of our work right now is focused on the establishment of new self-sustaining populations. As part of the federal draft recovery plan for Shousa Swallowtail, it calls for uh, several new self-sustaining populations to be um, established within the historic range of the butterfly. So in this slide, you show, I, I show Matt Standridge, one of our technicians, uh, releasing uh, second or third instar larvae of Shousa Swallowtail on the terminal growth of Torchwood on Lignavitae Key Botanical State Park within the Middle Keys. This was an historic site uh, detailed within collection records and a site that we are focused on trying to restore and establish a self-sustaining population. We, of course, also release adult butterflies where possible each individual is marked and hand paired prior to wild release. And we also try to implement a variety of best practices in the field to evaluate as an example, uh, enclosures meant to um, prevent uh, certain predators from uh, capitalizing on wild released individuals. So on the right hand portion, we see several interns working with my graduate student, Sarah Steele Cabrera, and large netting placed over an existing torchwood tree and larvae placed on this that would be followed daily until pupation. So where possible, again, we try to collect as much data uh, using each release as an, a true experiment uh, so that we can uh, grow in our understanding of what works well, what fails, and so future releases can incorporate that best practice to doing the better work of conservation moving forward. And then we rely a lot on our partners. We have excellent partners ranging across from the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection Division of Parks and Recreation. And here you see several of those par partners pictured. And where possible, we uh, really rely on them uh, for the on-the-ground implementation of wild releases and actually incorporate their personnel into the wild release of butterflies, larvae, or adults when possible. We've also teamed up uh, and are doing a lot of uh, increased habitat restoration for Shousa Swallowtail. We've teamed up with Fairchild Tropical Botanical Gardens in Southeast Florida to propagate the dominant uh, larval host plant, sea torchwood. Um, and uh, Fairchild personnel went out into the field, collected seed, propagates uh, young seedlings, and then these will in turn make their way out into wild restorations. And here you see uh, the result of some of those wild restorations, this being one on Elliott Key, uh, where now young torchwood have matured to almost human height. And this will allow for increasing the wild resources for this butterfly, uh, ensuring that as the population hopefully recovers and grows, it has ample food resources available to support it. 
And then over the last uh, six or so years, we've continued to uh, conduct wild releases from 2014 up to present day. And over that time, we have produced in captivity a little over 3,000 viable individuals and released between 2014 and 2021 over 1,500 individuals into the wild as larvae or adults. And we'll continue in 2021 and beyond to continue wild reintroduction efforts. In addition to uh, captive breeding and wild reintroduction, we are uh, working strongly to um, uh, better identify the current genetic history of this butterfly and also assess the population structure of it range wide. Because it is an island butterfly, we know that it can move across uh, water barriers, but we don't know the extent of that movement overall. So the goal here is really twofold, to collect genetic stock from the remaining extant populations to build back up the captive breeding population, ensure that the individuals in captivity are as close to wild individuals as possible. And then once those individually, individuals naturally die in captivity, use those specimens to um, better understand the existing genetic diversity of the wild population, ultimately also go back in time from collection records and collection specimens, looking at multiple time periods from the 1940s, 1970s, pre-Hurricane Andrew and current day to look at opportunities or incidences of bottlenecks historically within the wild population and also sample it brought across a wide range of different islands from Biscayne National Park, Northern Key Largo and even mainland South Florida. And hopefully once we conduct this population structure analysis, it will ultimately inform our reintroduction and management opportunities. And in the process, we're also digitizing all of our collections holdings and transcribing their associated data. So future beyond 2021 is we want to continue our annual population assessments, continue the captive breeding opportunities and organism reintroductions, targeting particularly Ligonvitae Key and other locations as per the draft recovery plan to establish new self-sustaining locations within the historic range, continue to collect samples for population structure analysis, where possible evaluate potential and ongoing threats, continue to evaluate and monitor the importance of that late season generation to the overall strength of the population, and ultimately evaluate minor disturbance events that historically were widespread due to hurricane or tropical storm uh, impacts on the islands that have shown to be really important for the butterfly new growth of host plants as well as nectar plants. So actually putting small minor anthropogenic disturbances to many of these habitat areas and seeing how the butterfly responds. So with all these efforts going on, we think that the future for Shousa Swallowtail is very bright. And with that, I wanna thank all the people in my lab and also our funders, the Disney Conservation Fund, National Park Service, National Refuge System, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Florida uh, Biodiversity Foundation, and the Florida State Park System. So thank you very much.